Hello everyone, and welcome to another Endgame video. About six months ago, I recorded a video that was part of a series that I started called Principles of Chess Endgames. And my idea then was to record five or six uh, videos on the most important endgame principles and to call it a day. And I was going to do the second video, but then I had a couple of conversations with my Twitch community and I sort of browsed uh, the internet and YouTube and I kind of realized that there is a very serious scarcity of endgame material available both in chess literature and on YouTube in particular. Now, when you hear the word the words endgame literature, you think of endgame instruction, what comes to mind for a lot of players is a book like this, which is, uh, I have the Russian version, but this is uh, Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual, perhaps the most famous and infamous endgame book of all time. And, and people think of pages and pages of dreary analysis and incredibly boring technical positions. And so I think this fear, this makes content creators uh, and, and chess YouTubers afraid of endgame videos. They're very hard to make. Endgames are tremendously complicated, but I think we can all agree. Um, and as I've found beyond a shadow of doubt, endgames are not only crucially important to understand, but they're perhaps the hardest part of the game to properly learn. And I realized that if I am to take the, the challenge head on, if I'm to take the bull by the horns, then what I should do is not five or six videos on endgame principles, but an entire database of videos uh, not only concerned with endgame principles, but also that go through endgames type by type that discuss pawn endgames and rook endgames and all of the principles of those endgames and that discuss endgame specific themes. And I realized that this project would extend to 50 or 60 videos rather than, than five or six. And so I started procrastinating. And finally, um, I don't know what exactly inspired me, but I figure if I never take this challenge on, then these 50 videos will never be created. And so I decided... Uh, to start the Endgame series properly and to continue it, uh, to continue it building from the ground up. Now, rather than jumping straight into the deep end, I want to take things gradually. I want to take things slowly. Endgames are an incredibly vast topic. I ask for your forgiveness in advance if, um, you know, if the videos aren't entirely well organized. I will learn as I go because I've barely ever made. Uh, endgame videos. But I want to start just kind of by inspiring you. I want to start with a discussion of why it's even worth studying endgames. And to do that, we have to dispel this idea that endgame study is necessarily boring, that it's uh, incredibly tedious, and that endgames are inaccessible and cannot be understood uh, you know, by players under 2,000 or, or under 1,500. None of those things are true. In fact, I think endgames not only can be understood by uh, intermediate players and, and even by beginners, but they have to be understood. Learning endgames will save you and earn you tons of points, but it will also offer you a prism through which you can view chess as a whole. It will help your middle games. It will help your overall chess understanding that has been proven and known for many years. So let's take it on. Okay, let me switch scenes here. And when I say I want to start by inspiring you, rather than jumping straight into pawn endgames with which we will begin our endgame odyssey, I would like to present <clears throat> and deeply analyze uh, an endgame from my chess career that stuck with me um, and still sticks with me to this day. It's probably one of the most mind-boggling and beautiful and amazing endgames that I have ever played. Um, it's incredibly deep. This endgame in and of itself teaches us a lot about endgame play, but the reason I want to show you this endgame is not only for its instructive value, but as a way for us to make and inroad as a way for us to sort of lift the proverbial champagne glass and start our endgame journey. So I'm going to analyze this endgame very deeply. There's a, a really cool story um, that stands behind this endgame, which I will be telling uh, as we analyze as well. And I hope that this will be a nice way to kick things off. Now, we will begin our endgame journey with pawn endgames. Uh, the first set of videos will be on pawn endgames. And um, as the videos start, and I have already have sort of an outline, we're basically going to start by by isolating and doing individual videos on all of the important general themes. And then the subsequent videos will put these themes together and examine more complicated endgames through the lens uh, and through the method that we develop in the initial videos. But all of that will be explained. And before we delve in, I just wanted to clarify that there will be other videos on my channel, right? I'll still be doing the speedrun videos. I will be recording endgame videos once every couple of days. So don't expect 50 videos to come out in the next 50 days. 
but you certainly can expect there to be less than a six month uh, waiting period between, between videos. So the position that you have in front of you um, occurred in 2014 in a game that I played with White against Grandmaster Conrad Holt, who is a fellow American Grandmaster. Now this game was played online in a tournament called the US Chess League, which is now the Pro Chess League. It's a team tournament that used to be played between, well, still is played between different cities. Uh, I was representing San Francisco at the time, um, and we were locked in a, we have a rivalry with Dallas. Uh, Conrad was attending the University of Texas at Dallas at the time. And so this was a very important game. Well, I played a phenomenal opening and middle game. I sacrificed many, many pieces. You can find this game online. Maybe I'll even analyze it at some point. And eventually, after, uh, after 40 moves, after 30 seven moves to be exact. The position in front of you was reached. It is white to move. It is my move. Now, let's look at this position for a short while just to see if we can get our heads around what's going on. Well, white is up two pawns. That's the first thing you might notice. It's a rook end game, king and rook versus king and rook. Um, but white is up two pawns. And apart from that, I also have four, yes, four passed pawns. And the b2 pawn is technically also a passed pawn. Now, two of them are doubled, but they're connected. There's a pawn on d5. B and A pawns, it looks like it's completely winning for white. But the more I looked at this position, and I didn't have forever, I had about 20 minutes left on my clock, I started to realize, well, it's not that simple. Because first of all, black has a pawn majority on the other side of the board. And if you fall asleep, well, black has the uh, possibility of moving his own pawns down the board and eventually creating a far advanced passer of his own. So there's not a lot of time to waste. The second thing I noticed was that it's not that easy for white to push his pawns. If you play A4, then you blunder the B pawn. Okay, you can play b3, but where are you going from there? And so after about two or three minutes, I identified an interesting idea. I noticed that you could play the move rook to c4. Now, you give up one of your pass pawns, but in return, you make sure that the others can move. Now you play b3, protecting the rook. Let's say that black plays e4 and pushes his own pawns. Well, now these pawns are free to move forward. You can go a4. Black can continue pushing his pawns, but black's progress is so much slower. And after b5... White is basically winning. These pawns are unstoppable in the long run. So for instance, if black plays f4, these pawns are still not that easy to push forward. If you go rook b4, um, which is, by the way, possible, you can prepare a5, but you have to deal with king c5. So the winning method here is actually to activate this rook in a very common technique that we will talk a lot about, the rook infiltrating the enemy territory and then attacking pawns from behind and white is winning here. You can do some analysis on your own. This is a little bit outside the scope of what I'm going to talk about, but white is very convincingly winning by combining the idea of pushing pawns with the idea of just picking off all of black's exposed pawns. And if the rook tries to help out, then of course the a pawn move forward, moves forward. Now I saw this and I knew that it was probably winning, but after a little bit more reflection, I found a very, very interesting idea that I thought was quite a bit more convincing. Now, anytime you have a rook end game, you have to open up to the possibility of a liquidation that is a transition to a pawn end game. And it is critically important to always keep in mind um, the question of who benefits in the event of a rook trade, because if it is you, then that is often the simplest way of converting an advantage. And as you might notice, there's the possibility of forcing a transition to a pawn end game with a move rook c6 check. And so I started to evaluate this move. Well, black has to, has to trade. We take on c6. Okay, black has to take on c6. And I tried to wrap my head around this position, realized it was not that easy because both sides have their respective pawn majorities. Um, and at first I, I was skeptical because the thing about this four on two, right, is that black can essentially create two passed pawns on either side of the board, on either side of the king side, a situation that, there, that there's a name for only in Russian uh, you say shtanli, or literally trousers, right? I think it's named because there are two pant legs uh, that are resembled by the pawns that are moving forward. So how can this happen? Well, let's say white uh, just dilly-dallies, or white pushes the pawn. What's going to happen is this, g5. White's pawns are going nowhere. The black king is going to stop them easily. And let's just move back and forth to illustrate this concept. Black goes h4, then black goes e4, then g4. Black pushes all of the pawns in order, and... Uh, then black goes f4, and here black is ready to create the passed pawns. First black goes h3. Now that pawn white can stop, but the combination of these pawns white cannot. e2, h2, and black promotes. And by the way, a detail that will be important later on. White can try to halt the progress of black's pawns with g3. 
Here black can play h3, and it's not at first clear how to create a second pass pawn. Here the concept of the pawn breakthrough comes to the rescue. This, uh, there will be a video specifically dedicated to that concept. Black plays f4, sacrificing a pawn. This looks like madness, but hopefully you can see the follow-up. Now another pawn is sacrificed, g3, clearing the way for this e pawn. And you get the same scenario as before. These pawns are useless. They're nowhere near promotion. And black wins the game. The queen will pick up all of white's uh, extra pawns. So I calculated this pretty quickly, and I, I realized that this was not an option. But then, right as I was about to reject this line, I, I spotted a very interesting idea. My idea was, okay, I have a move that actually forces black to ruin his kingside pawn structure. I can make a sacrifice of my own that brings black's pawns closer together so that they resemble my pawns, and perhaps that will prevent black from creating a passer. And you can pause the video, try to find the move. You'll have plenty of opportunities to do that in subsequent videos. The move that I ended up playing is f4. I was very proud of this move when I made it. Rare is the occasion when you sacrifice anything in a pawn endgame. And hopefully you can quickly see what the idea is. Now, first of all, black has the move e4. But now it is no longer possible to create a second passed pawn. White can play the move g3 just to fully prevent the progress of black's pawns. And technically, it is possible to create a second passed pawn. You can go g5 and then f4. But there, this is a different story because white's passer is now far closer to promotion and black's passers are nowhere near promotion. And so white makes a queen um, long before black and wins the game. Now, you might look at, this, look at this and say, well, how does white actually win the game? Because the white king is tied down to the black passer on e4. And we'll get to that in just a moment, just in a slightly different version. So my opponent ended up taking on f4. And you get, after king f2, a crazy endgame. I mean, how often does an endgame like this occur? A four on one on one side and a three on zero on another. I knew this would get crazy. And I thought that I had calculated this all the way to the win. How did I even approach the question of how to calculate this endgame? Well, I did something that I refer to as long-term calculation and Later on down the line, this will be a more advanced video, but we will talk about this. Long-term calculation essentially means uh, you act as a meteorologist. You, you, you try to forecast what's going to happen in 10 or 15 moves without physically calculating the moves themselves. And the way that I did this is I first imagined that all of the pawns would be gone from the king side. Imagine if all of the pawns were gone from the king side and why just had these three passers. This is not a conventional setup, not a pawn structure I was familiar with. Rarely do you get a, a double B pawn. And the question that I wanted to ask myself, if we transition to this position, is whether the pawns can self-sufficiently promote. Can they promote without the assistance of white's king? And that question is not too hard to answer. So let's imagine that. White goes b3. It forces the black king back. Looks very promising. And I don't know what to compare this motion to. I feel like it's almost like a starfish or like a medusa moving um, in, in a weird kind of way. After king a6, you push this pawn. And then the role of the double pawn is to move forward and force the black king back. If the king takes the pawn, then white promotes. Okay, so the black king moves back. But now you reach a dead end. If you go a5, you give up one of your pawns. This is where you do need your king. But I figured you don't actually need your king to help out. You just need to make a pass move with your king. That forces the black king back, and the entire process repeats itself again. Really, really cool stuff. a7, a5 b6. If king b7, then just b5, accelerating the process. So king a6, b5, check king b7. You need another king move. King f2. The black king has to move back. Keep it going. a6, king a8, b7, king a7, b6, king b8. Wait a minute. There's no checkmate. a7 check. The king takes on b7. And if you make a pass, well, it's stalemate. So I figured at first, so what does that mean? Does that mean this doesn't work? But now we have to add the pawns because we have to see how that changes this narrative. And I all of a sudden had a light bulb moment. Okay, so I went back to this position. I said, okay, let's think about what can happen. Let's imagine a scenario where white can do all of that, but somehow, um, so, I mean, somehow you're able to eliminate all of black's pawns and you actually do have your king, uh, which you can use. Well, then, oh, sorry about that. Um, then also keeping an eye, keeping an eye on, on Levy's tournament game here. Then what can happen is, well, simply speaking, even if you reach this position, that's not a problem. You can play a7 check giving up the pawn. 
And if you have the assistance of your king, you just walk your king toward the queen side. And this is a very well-known theoretical win. What you do, this might not be, not be that easy if you don't know the process. Because you reach this position, and if you go king c6, it's stalemate. And if you go king d6, it's unclear how to make progress. Here, I would encourage you to pause the video, if you're not familiar with this win, and try to find uh, the very pretty winning sequence. I'm going to take a, a sip of coffee. Okay. So the winning move is actually a8 queen. You sacrifice the second of three pawns. After king takes a8, not king c7 stalemate, but king c6. Diagonal opposition, very important. King b8, b7. And hopefully at this point, you know the drill. King a7, king c7, king a6, and you make a queen. So whether white is able to win is predicated on the, on the question of whether you will have the services of your king once your pawns reach the seventh and sixth rank. So that is the question that I set up set out to answer. Can white's king and pawn little team contain all of black's pawns put together? And this is where I started calculating. Now that I have the roadmap in mind, I started calculating. And at the end of my calculation, I figured, yes, it is possible to stop the four pawns. And I was right, except there was one wrinkle that I failed to account for. Let's take a look at what happened in the game. My opponent started with king b5. I responded with b3, much like we expected. And, of course, black starts pushing the pawns. He's got nothing else he can do. And here's what I did. I made a little triangle. This is a notion known as triangulation with my king. I went king f3. Now, black doesn't want to move his king back. He doesn't want to allow the pawns to progress. So he goes h4. Now I drop my king back to e2. Conrad goes g4, and I go king f2. And this is what I calculated to, because here's the thing. If black pushes h3... What happens? Well, white takes it. And white easily contains these two pawns because they're only one file apart. And the process starts to uh, repeat itself. King has to move back. You go a4. Now, you already know how white wins this. So I'm going to go quickly. King f2. You do have waiting moves with their king. That's the critical factor here. King b7, a5. Let's get to the uh, critical moment here. You make another waiting move with your king. Blah, blah, blah. a6, b7, king a7, b6, king b8. And here's the critical moment. Now, you can't exactly walk forward with your king because black still has pawns. But what you can do is another waiting move. Black has to push one of his pawns. Let's say he plays f3. You take that one. Black pushes f4. You go back. Black pushes h2. You take all of the pawns except one of them. You reach a situation like this. Now you might say, oh, king g2, and that's it. We win. No, 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 no. Black makes a queen, and now it's stalemate. So at the very, very last second... You have to play a7 check. This is a beautiful idea. King takes b7. Now you play king g2. And now black's king has plenty of squares. But the pawn is, uh, is dead. You're going to take the pawn and you're going to win in exactly the way that we discussed. So this is the basic winning mechanism, or so I thought. You wait until black has only one pawn left. Uh, you, you, you play waiting moves to get black and Zugzwang. And when that pawn is on the second rank, that's when you play a7 check. You pick up the pawn and you walk your king forward. And I was, again, really proud of finding this. I thought this was going to be a great win. And I thought that I had it all figured out. But let's rewind all the way back to this position. So here's what Conrad did. At first, I thought he's biting the bullet. He went king c6, king b6, b5. I did the whole thing. Now I make a waiting move, king back to g1, expecting h3 or f3. Then Conrad played g3. And I saw this move, but I didn't fully appreciate it. I thought, well, it's going to lead to the same exact thing, king f1. He went f3, g takes f3. This looks scary, but I thought, okay, my king is containing the black pawns. I still have waiting moves. We're still going according to plan. He went h3. Now I pushed my f pawn up to f4 just to eliminate this extra move. And now we start repeating the process. King b7, a5, king a7, b6, king b7, b5, king b8, a6. Everything is great. b7, b king g1, waiting move, king b8. And here... I saw something and this caused immediate horror because I was totally oblivious to this as I was pushing my pawns. I was about to play b6, right? We're good. Black's going to give up one of these pawns. You're going to take the other one. You're going to play a7 at the right moment. Well, do you see what the wrinkle is? Do you see what I haven't, hadn't properly understood? Pause the video. See if you can figure it out. Well, the problem is that black doesn't go g2. Actually, g2 is fine. But my opponent would go h2. That's the most forcing move. After king g2... Black gives up the pawn. This is the scenario that we're aiming for. But the problem is that he gives up the last pawn by force. You don't have time to play a7. You don't have time for it. 
You have to, if you don't take the pawn, black promotes to a queen. If you block the pawn, it's stalemate. And if you take the pawn, it's stalemate because the F pawn is blocked. And by the way, if I hadn't gone F4, then black would have gone F4. It doesn't matter who goes F4. The point is that the F pawn will have no more squares. So amazingly, let's fast forward again. Amazingly, there is no way for white to win one of the pawns and buy time to go A7. You might say, well, what if we circumvent the problem by going a7 first? Well, then black doesn't have to give away his pawns. Then we're at a standoff and neither side can do anything. So either you allow stalemate or you give up your b-pawn and then it's just a positional draw. I, I really, you know, as I was playing, I was quite amazed at this because you rarely get a kind of a situation like this. The game actually ended. I played king g1. Conrad played h2. Sorry, I played. Oh, yeah, no, I played king h1 here. So we were looking at b6, but I played a meaningless waiting move, king a7, b6, king b8, king g1, and the game actually ended like this. h2 check, king h1. He gives up the g2 pawn first. Doesn't matter which pawn you give up first. King takes g2, h1 queen. King takes h1, and three pawns up. Stalemate, and a draw was declared. Okay. I was really amazed at this end game. I spent a long time analyzing it, and I actually uh, published this. In a ch I was writing for chess.com at the time. I was writing weekly articles, and I wrote an article that featured this game. I was really amazed by all of these ideas, and I decided to, to share this with the world. I don't remember in which article I shared it. I, can look I don't have this information at the ready. I think it was an article on Stalemate uh, or, or an article on Pawn Endgames. It could have been one of the two. So I analyzed all of this, and you can probably hunt that article down. And I thought, well, this is a really interesting endgame. Fast forward a couple of months. Okay, I get an email. Emails from my good friend, uh, Dana McKenzie. Dana is a national master also lives in the Bay Area, and uh, we're very good friends. Uh, he's an incredible person. Uh, if you look, look him up on Google, he recently wrote a bestseller uh, book on science. Uh, I think it's called The Science of Why. Uh, he's a, a scientist, mathematician, sort of a renaissance man. He's written many books, uh, really one of the best people that I know, and he helped me tremendously when I was writing my first book. Uh, he was my main proofreader. He proofread the entire book. He made incredible uh, edits and suggestions, and uh, mastering positional chess in my second book would not be even close to what they are uh, without Dana's help. So we've uh, been, we correspond about certain positions. He has a great blog on chess. Anyways, I get an email from him. Okay, Dana McKenzie. Uh, the email subject title is your game against Holt. And it says Daniel, I was analyzing your uh, I was reading your, your chess.com article. I was looking at your game against Holt. I had a question about it, and that question led me to analyze it, and I found something incredible. So in the position after rook c6 d6. Dana said that black is winning. He thought black was winning. And I was laughing. You're funny, Dana, because if we're talking about anybody winning, it's white. And I, of course, checked this with Stockfish or, or Frit. I don't remember what I used at the time. I checked this with the engine. If you flip on the engine and you look at it under depth 30, even now, it says that it gives like an advantage for white. It gets plus one for white, which you can interpret to mean that white is the one pushing. But if you let the computer sit for longer, you will see that Dana is right. What the heck? What could it possibly be? Well, the amazing thing, and maybe you caught this, maybe you didn't. I said I told you a lie when I was first showing you this game. And I tried to slip this lie in, you know, really low key and casually. The lie that I said is that black has to take the C pawn. Well, black doesn't have to take the C pawn. But that sounds absurd. Are you saying that you're going to leave white with four connected pass pawns? Well, that's exactly what Dana was saying. Remember something I said earlier. We analyzed the line where white does not play f4. If white does not play f4 and disconnect black's pawns or bring black's pawns closer together and black wins. So we analyzed uh, a4 and we found that if black is able to play g5, he wins. Because by the way, if you play f4 now, that doesn't help. Black plays gf4 and this construction is winning. Black basically pushes the h pawn and then you know the drill, f3, h3, and the h and e pawns uh, tear the king apart. So Dana's question was, what if black doesn't take the pawn, but instead plays the move g5? We already know that g5 is winning without the c pawn. Isn't it winning with the c pawn? And it turns out that it is. It turns out that black's king can keep the four pass pawns contained for long enough for black to uh, make a queen and push his own pawns. Let's take a look at what that looks like. And I have Stockfish open on, on the chess.com interface. It's still showing that white is winning and it's giving b5. And I'll tell you the moment at which it changes its mind. At depth 25, it was giving a win for white. So b5. Okay, well, um, let's say black plays e4. 
And here's the problem. White plays a4. White starts pushing the pawn. Black doesn't even need to move his king yet. Black plays the move h4. Stockfish is still giving a win for white. But now it's lowering its evaluation, but still it doesn't realize what's going on, which is truly amazing. Let's say that white continues to push pawns. Now here white is threatening a6. So at this point, you have to step back with your king in order to meet a6 with king b6. You've got the pawns completely contained. White has no choice but to make a waiting move with his king. But now black plays g4, and you already know the drill. This is exactly the same mechanism as before. The engine's still not seeing it. And now it's beginning to see a depth 25. It's giving equality. Now it's giving a slight advantage for black, still giving equality. It says that g3 equalizes. Let's take a look. h3. And finally, it sees that black is winning. Only at this point does it see that black is winning. a6, king b6, king g1. And you know the idea. f4, g takes f4, g3. F takes g3, e3. And black wins. There is simply nothing that white can do about it. The pawn, added pawn on c6 makes absolutely no difference. We already analyzed um, the move f4, and we saw that black, is, that black is winning. The only other move I looked at was g3, trying to slow down the pawns. And black even has time now to capture the pawn, because f4 is no longer effective. f4, black plays gf and e4. So again, you have nothing better to do than to move your king up, and black wins in exactly the same way as uh, we're already familiar with. By the way, if white tries g4, setting a trap, right? You don't take on g4, you play h4. Trousers are very important here. The quality of pass pawns is so much more important than the quantity and of pawns in general. So h4 wins. And if what I analyzed was gf, and you know the drill, e3, doesn't matter where the king goes, and black wins. The pawns are unstoppable. h4, king f3, h3, king e3, h2, and black wins by one tempo. These pawns are not going anywhere. And when I first saw this, this blew my mind because what's so amazing about this is how your brain automatically takes c6. Everybody I've showed this position to, all my students, even some grandmasters, nobody even thinks about not taking the pawn. Conrad took it within a couple of seconds because how can you not? And yet the beauty of this endgame is that black wins the game by leaving this pawn alone and focusing on creating a passer. And it is this depth, it's this just this paradox, this beauty that I think really makes endgames so rewarding to analyze. Because the more you analyze them, the more you realize that, yes, there is the component of endgames that's boring. You have to learn the theoretical position. You have to memorize stuff. Yes, you got to do that, but that's chess. But there's also this whole other endgame world, which, which features incredible tactical ideas. And pawn endgames are probably my favorite in this regard. As we'll start exploring them, you will see how many incredible ideas there are, even in positions that look ridiculously simple. That's what makes chess magical. You could have a pawn and a king for each side, and you have unbelievable, mind-boggling complications. And you have so much tactics because the nature of pawn endgames is that you want to create past pawns, and so you will do anything to do that. And as in this position, you can see that the number of pawns often simply doesn't matter. And so this game has stayed with me for a very long time. I got to give a shout out to Grandmaster Joel Benjamin, who wrote an excellent book on liquidation and chess, the transition to pawn endgames. And he featured this game. This was just a year or so ago. And he actually found the win. He didn't make that mistake. So that's basically what I have for you on the inspiration front. We will look at so many amazing endgames, endgames similar to this one, similar in their complexity and their depth and their beauty. We will also look at boring positions that you have to know. I will try to cover every aspect of endgames uh, that you have to know in order to embark on the path to end game mastery. And once again, before I close the video, I want to remind everybody that this is the first time I'm trying something like this. There will be some stumbling around. Some of the videos might be um, improperly structured or long winded, but I will do my very best to be as comprehensive as possible. So we will start with pawn end games. We will explore the basic underlying themes of pawn end games, which are also the basic underlying themes of end games as a whole. That's why it makes sense to start with pawn end games. The next video is going to be either about pawn races uh, or about past pawns. I haven't decided yet. So we'll have five or six videos on themes for pawn end games, knight end games, rook end games, and then we'll have a couple of videos transitioning to uh, applying those themes and understanding end games as a whole. So buckle in, ladies and gentlemen. I'll be making a, an end game video once every couple of days. This will join the rotation of speedrun videos, and I will do my very, very best to fill, or at least partially fill this void in chess instruction. So thank you for watching. Um, and I want to thank everybody in the chess community on Reddit, on my Twitch for uh, the incredible feedback. Uh, you know, this just this idea to create endgame videos is it, I owe to 
uh, to tons of people who, who, who provide incredible and invaluable feedback to my channel. So thank you to all of you. I hope you enjoyed this video and prepare for your endgame odyssey. Buckle in, everybody. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video.